I'm David Grasso from Gen FKD. I'm here with another esteemed guest. How you doing, Erica? I'm great. How Thanks are you? for having me. Bring your human to work. I don't think we do that a lot. You <laughs> well, were telling you, well, me this. You will after you read this book. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> so tell me, what is a human and why should you bring it to work? Well, you should bring it to work for a number of reasons. And you know, in this technological age, one of the things that I've seen, and I've been a workplace strategist for the last 20 plus years is that more and more we are phoning it in, texting bad news to our clients. I even talked to a CEO recently about a conference call that took place in his company. And after a conference call with nine people, they realized that all nine people had called into the call from the same building. So the question is, <laughs> Does that matter to us as humans, and does it matter to the bottom line of our business? And spoiler alert, yes, it does. So what was the percentage you were talking about? Because we always have a little bit of pre-chat off camera before we do, but sharing with the audience, you were saying that it's important to bring your human, what percentage of the time? I think in life, you know, 80-20 works. So try to bring your human to work 80% of the time. You know, more than that's always a good thing. So it's a balance, it's okay to check out sometimes. Well, bringing your human to work, I mean, checking out is an important part of bringing your human to work. So this is not about being on 24-7 in any way. And actually, there's a whole chapter in the book called Disconnect to Reconnect. And if you don't find time and space to, to disconnect, it's much more difficult to be human when you actually are at work and, you know, in life. So let's step back a little bit. What did you obviously have a lot of professional experience in this area? This is what you've dedicated your professional life to. But what inspired you to write it all down? Because there's so, a difference between being a practitioner and being an author. 100%. So, yes, I've spent the last 20 years in the human capital space, really helping companies improve their performance through people. So, I've always been very curious about the impact of people at work and how people connect. And as technology was becoming more and more prevalent, I started seeing and hearing people talking about this human piece even more. So it was sort of in the back of my mind as a practitioner, to your point. So one day, I live on the Upper West Side, and every day, pretty much, I go to my local Starbucks, which is at 81st and Broadway. You order on your phone, of course. Well, interestingly, no. In the beginning, no. Now I order on the app. Yeah. But for years, I would go in, and I got to know my barista, and of her name course. is Ashley Peterson, and she would see me coming, and she would start to make my drink. So she not only got to know me, she got to know my kids, because we would pass the Starbucks on the way to school. So about five years ago, one of my daughters started, you know, fell in love with the pumpkin scone. And if any of you are <laughs> Starbucks fans, you know that the pumpkin spice latte and the pumpkin scone is only around right now, you know, around September, October, and come November 1st, they, they start to run out of pumpkin scones. <laughs> so Ashley would start to tell me when the pumpkin scones were going to run out until, and she would put them aside for me and, and really let me know ahead. So one day she said, you know, I have to let you guys know this is the last pumpkin scone of the season. So the next day, my kids and I, we go into Starbucks. She hands me my grande extra hot soy latte, which is my drink. And again, this is pre-app. And my daughter was very pouty because that was it for the pumpkin scones. We continue walking down Broadway, and all of a sudden, I hear Ashley screaming my name. I thought that I left my wallet there because, yes, it was before the app. She comes running down, and she said, I just want you to know, I, Caroline, I, you know, we're out of pumpkin scones, but now that it's November, it's Christmas season, and I, I, I was thinking about you and that you might like this gingerbread. And she gave it to us. It made my day, made my daughter's day. And as a workplace strategist, I'm sitting there thinking, this is unbelievable. You know, talk about someone who went above and beyond, went, came out from behind the counter, connected with us. And in that moment, I'm like, wow, Ashley really brought her human to work. And it was in that moment where I thought, in this age where we are all connecting digitally, which is not a bad thing, but we still need to create opportunities, space for that human connection. And that was the moment where the idea was born. That's amazing. Yeah, she definitely brought her human that day. She did. And what I love about Ashley um, is that not, I not only noticed how amazing she was and thought about how, if I could bottle this or if any company could bottle this, you could literally crack the code on, on any type of business. Starbucks took notice and 
sadly for me, she's been promoted five times. Of is course. no longer <laughs> at the Starbucks on, on right near my apartment, and now she runs her very own store. Okay, so let's talk about the workplace. So you're, you're, tell me a little bit about the spaghetti project first, okay. of course. So while I was doing the research for this book, I came across this amazing study out of Cornell University by a professor named Kevin Niffen. And Kevin was getting his advanced degree in organizational psychology and had to study a group and look at group performance. And his father was a firefighter. And so it made, he grew up in firehouses, so it made sense that that was the group he was gonna study. And what Kevin found was that the firefighters who were the most dedicated to the long-standing tradition of the firehouse meal, sitting around the table, you know, with the other firefighters, building trust, it actually correlated with higher performance, and those firefighters save more lives. And so when I saw this study, it was a real aha moment for me. It was something I knew it intuitively, but now there was science to, to back it up. And so the Spaghetti Project was born because as I began interviewing firefighters and visiting firehouses, the stereotypical go-to meal for firefighters is spaghetti and meatballs. And so the Spaghetti Project is a platform that shares the science and stories of connection at work. You know, and sometimes that's hard. You know, recently, uh, my right-hand man at work, I work at a nonprofit that helps sponsor the show. It's called Jen of KD. And he texted me while sitting next to me. And I really lost it because I'm a little older than him. And I said, you know, this is unacceptable. I'm sitting right here. But how common is that? And does it ruin performance? Does it, does it make us l workers that are less efficient and, you know, able to do our own work? It does. It does impact performance 100%. I talk about finding the sweet spot between leveraging technology to build relationships and connection. I mean, we're doing a Facebook Live right now. We wouldn't be here without this technology, yeah. but we also need to put, it, put technology in its place and connect in this way. So if all someone does is text you, that will 100% decrease performance over time. And so the key as, as leaders is to create real organizational protocols to determine when it's best to text, when it's best to pick up the phone, walk down the hall, get on a plane. They are clearly, all of those mediums are not created equal. So speaking of humans, look at all these questions. We wow. Have. So let's pick out a few audience questions here. So let's think about the workplace in the next 10 to 20 years. How is it going to change? Is it be, still going to be human or is it going to be less human? I feel confident that it will still be human. You know, I often say that, that you know, we have AI and, and technology is changing all of our jobs and pieces of all of our jobs, but that only makes the human part that much more important. It becomes the differentiator. Once the technology takes over these five pieces, what's left? It's the human piece that's left. That's our value so we add. Need, it is our value add. So we need to get better at that human piece. That's, that's a great answer. Do you plan on writing any more books and would they be on the same subject? Or are you a secret fiction writer that we don't know about? <laughs> um, I can see myself writing another book in the future. And, you know, I, my gut tells me there might, you know, I'm getting so much positive feedback and interest in the Spaghetti Project that, you know, I might look at going deeper on spaghetti projects in all different people's lives. So let's talk about other places besides the workplace where we bring our human. This is an audience question. Do you think your strategies could work at school or even home? Yeah, well, 100%. I have three kids, and um, they don't like the fact that they were the last kids in their grade to get Instagram. But I think that, <laughs> that the content that might be in, healthy. <laughs> in Bring Your Human to Work can relate to all of these different aspects of our lives. and so. One of the ways, one of the things I talk about is the importance of creating protocols because, excuse the cheesy pun, but left to our own devices, <laughs> we're not connecting, <laughs> right? So we need, to, we need to curate connection, whether that's at work, whether that's at home, whether that's at the doctor, right? You go to the doctor, you want to connect with him or of her course. face to face, but they're almost typing. So some doctor's offices will now have a scribe sure. so that they're taking notes so that the doctor and the patient can connect more on a human level. On the school front, I just saw an email recently that was setting protocols for teachers and giving the teachers expectations, but also the parents and the students, when it was okay to text and email a teacher and what was the appropriate 
response time. You know, are teachers expected, if the kids are staying up all night, are the teachers expected to get back to them? So I think without these rules of the road, you know, none of us know what to do. And so it's up to leaders in companies, it's up to the heads of school, it's up to the parents in the home to think about creating these, these, these protocols. How did we get here, Erica? Isn't bringing your human common sense, isn't it funny that we now had to have rules of the road? Because, you know, even when, when I was a little kid not that long ago, we didn't have these devices distracting us. Right. We didn't have the option of texting our boss or, well, how the hell did we get here? <laughs> well, I would say a couple things. Number one, we feel like we have been doing this forever, yet the iPhone last summer had its 10 year anniversary. Yes. So we think it's forever, but in reality it is still new, which is why, you know, it's, which is why we need those rules of the road. And when I was traveling around the country interviewing CEOs and millennials and everybody in between, the, the, the image and the thought that kept coming into my mind was that this is the Wild West. <laughs> Which it is. And so my, the image is like we need, so what do we need in the Wild West? We need a sheriff to help create order at home, at school, and at work. And so the other thing that I'll say as it relates to that question is I had a call the other day with someone who I, I was going to do a keynote. And she said, well, this doesn't seem very new. You know, we know that we shouldn't be on this technology 24-7. I said, yes, we know it, but, and, and it's not rocket science, but we still can't do it. So we still need help. We still need those rules of the road b because we don't know what we're doing. Well, and can these devices help us be more human in some ways? Yes, and that goes back to the sweet spot. Finding that sweet spot, 100%, it can help us be more human, but we have to do what I call match the message to the medium. Pause and say to ourselves, we can communicate along a continuum, instant message, text, email, phone, getting on a plane, doing this, and they are not created equal. But as a society, we are defaulting to this technological end of the spectrum. And sometimes it's great and it can make us more human, right? If I'm running 10 minutes late, I'll send you a text. You'll be annoyed if I call you just to say, I'm running a few minutes late. Yet if I'm running an hour late for this interview, you know, I better step it up. And so it's just thinking more strategically about our use of technology. And I'm a huge technology fan, so the book in no way is anti-technology. It's just let's use it smarter. So let's talk about conflict avoidance. So part of being a human is conflict, right? And delivering bad news, mm -hmm. receiving bad news, etc. I feel like a lot of us use this as an outlet to avoid this when we're dealing with, content, with conflict. Mm -hmm. 100%. So you just gave that example earlier where you had someone sitting next to you texting you. And so it's up to us as leaders and organizations to set the ground rules. That is not okay. Or <laughs> it's <you>. not okay <laughs> to text bad news to a client. It will differ in every industry. It will differ in every organization. It goes back to company values. And the first chapter in the book is, is really the most important and it's called Be Real, How to Speak in an Authentic Voice. What are your values as a company? What are your values as a person? And if you're, I call it the fork in the road test. If you're at that fork in the road, do I send an email, do I pick up the phone? How do I communicate? How do I deal with any issue? Your values should help tell you whether you should turn left or turn right. But that seems to be so normalized now, especially with, think about it, uh, you know, dating is one of the places where, you know, new trends show up most obviously. Mm -hmm. We see a trend of ghosting, breaking up by text. This right. is rife. It's everywhere, well, We see Erica. ghosting at work. Yeah, they, they don't quit. They just stop showing up. Exactly, exactly. How did that become normalized? And how uh, these values don't seem to be, like we would never want someone to do that to us. So why do people feel like it's okay to do it to other people? Well, I think that's what people need to stop and say to themselves, I am interacting with another human being and how would I want that person to, to treat me? Sadly though, it goes back to left to our own devices. We are, we are so sucked into this technology, one, because it was designed to suck us in, two, to your point, it can exacerbate some of the, persona the, the our personality traits. So if we are one that tends to avoid, we, we might default to that. But I would then say it goes back to having real conversations at work 
with your team and, and giving examples. This happened the other day, this is not okay. You know, and, and this is why it impacts our business. Let's go back to that, because that was at the back of my mind, too, that a lot of the developers of these types of devices have come out and admitted mm -hmm. that they hack your brain. They have hacked your brain, and they know that this is a pleasure center. Like, the, you cannot put this down. Mm -hmm. We are powerless over these things, no pun intended. Right. How does that affect our lives, and how, how do we win the battle if we are truly powerless against these things? I don't think we will ever win the battle, but it is, it's about being intentional and being aware, and even leveraging technology to help us manage our technology. And so I got the new iPhone literally yesterday. I don't even know how to use it. Had it the, the, the whatever it is, I don't know. XS, My phone whatever was it is. dying, I'm going on this book tour, I'm like, I need, it. I need a new phone. So I've had it 24 hours. What I did notice this morning as I started to figure out what I can do with it, it does start to show you by default how much I was on Facebook, how much, so already the was it data, shocking? well, it's only been a few hours, not yet, but it might be, <laughs> but, but, but that awareness piece will then help me manage it. The other thing that I'll share, which, which is very relevant for many of us out there that have kids, uh, Fortnite is the, a huge craze. All these kids are addicted to Fortnite. They're on it 24-7. And so an example where to... What, part of my ignorance, what is Fortnite? Fortnite, is, it's an online game. Like the creator of Fortnite just became a billionaire. It's, all these kids are on it. You know, it's just, it's a game that these kids play. Probably some adults even it's play. It's the new Farmville, it is the new, it is the, Exactly, it is the new Farmville. And so you see these articles, New York Times, parents going, I never used to fight with my kids. Now we all hate each other because of Fortnite. And so... When you asked the question earlier about how can you use, use technology to get you maybe off of a device, I have an app that I have been using for the last six months, which has changed my life, called Our Pact. It's O-U-R-P-A-C-T, Our Pact. I put it on my phone. My kids hate it. I put it on my kid's phone. With a, with a touch of a swipe, I can turn off his apps from here. And really? so instead of getting into a fight, I can say, you know what? I know that when you're doing your homework, you should not be on your phone. And I know since he goes to bed later than I am that it's not good for him to be on his phone late night. I can, I can set up those protocols. So whether it's in your life, whether it's at work, we have to be more intentional. And whether that's leveraging technology to be more intentional or leveraging our face-to-face -face conversations, it's not going to happen with a lot, without a lot of deep conversation about it. So, we have so many more questions here. Do you think social media changes our core values? I hope Because you talked a, talked a lot about a value proposition, like how do you make good decisions based on your values? I think it will often cause us to go back and question those values, which is a positive thing. And you know, one of the things I talk about with companies is that I was at a conference recently and I said to the audience, so everybody raise your hand. Does your company have a set of values? Every single person raised their hand. And then I went back and I said, but when you think about those values, are they platitudes on the wall or are they alive you know, in the halls? Do you know them? Do you feel them? I'd say I got about 50% response rate and that might have been a little high also. So the key is to constantly be going back as your business has changed, as the world has changed, and say, are, are these our core values? Does this boil down who we are? And the other mistake that companies make a lot is that they have way too many values, 10, 12, 14 values. <laughs> Clearly that- We have all the values. <laughs> fork in the road, right, what don't we value? You know, three to five values is really about it if you want it to, to distill down to who is the, the essence of who you are whether it's a business or whether it's a person. So can social media change it? It might cause you to really question it and look in the mirror. But at the end of the day, I think my guess is if you have strong values, it won't change based on social media. Well, I guess my question is, Erica, you know, one of the most disappointing things about growing up is that a lot of people who don't bring their human to work advance a lot to the highest offices in the world. And, you know, how does that work? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm someone who's been held back in my career because of my values. You know, being on media, if I were more politically extreme, left or right, I'd probably get more traction. And that's just one example of millions of people and everyone who's watching. Sometimes mm -hmm. 
your values directly conflict with your career trajectory, and there's far too many people who are willing to sell out. True. However, I still believe, it sounds like, as do you, that those people that do stick to those core values ultimately will come out ahead. It might just take a little longer. Now, I agree that you there are- You sound like my mother, there are, all right, well, <laughs> there are people who have ascended to the highest levels in office um, who have, may have values-related issues. However, I will say that there are many people that surround some of these very senior leaders who have put stuff out there in their social media and their day has come. And so I do think when you are putting things in the world, you know, that social media can bring it to light much faster, which is why all of us need to be careful what we're putting out there. But when it is, when it, when it, are, when it is things that are aligned with our values, we, we clearly don't have to worry as much. So for those people in business who have gotten ahead by being the biggest jerk in the room, now in this world of social media, people find out about it much more quickly. So you think transparency has a way of sanitizing a lot of these issues? 100%, and what's, what's amazing about the workplace today is that millennials, who will represent 75% of the workforce by 2025, and now we have Gen Z coming up right behind them, they are demanding transparency in a way that, that past generations didn't. And so they are bringing they want value, they want meaning, they want flexibility, they want all these great things in the workplace. And so everybody else is gonna have to sort of step up and provide that or they're not gonna be able to retain great talent. So when I go to work, what are things I should remember that you mentioned in the book, Erica? Honor relationships. Honor relationships. That is the number one thing. And what, we need, when I, what I mean by honoring relationships is honoring relationships with your clients, with your customers, with your guests, and with yourself. To not forget about yourself in, in that process. And honoring relationships is thinking about how we use technology in a smart way, how in our day we put it in its place. And it's also about this idea of, of curating connection. Because going back to left to our own devices, we're not, it's just not gonna happen automatically. So it's just not a naturally occurring thing because, you know, one, I'm a millennial, of course, and one of the biggest things is getting the job. We don't really think a lot about once we have the job, what happens next. Maybe we think about advancement, salary, health insurance. We, re we really don't think about our peers at work or the workplace landscape or the day to day. When I'm envisioning my next career move, I'm just imagining getting the job. I'm not really planning out for what happens next. Well, but what's interesting to me from a workplace strategist perspective is that what will make you most engaged at work and happy at work are those peers, are those values, is that culture, especially in the millennial generation. You need to make a decent amount of money, but that is not a differentiator anymore. And so you know, the, the well-known Gallup study that found that, that when you have a best friend at work, you are seven times more engaged in your job wow. and much less likely to leave. And when I looked more deeply at that study, well, what do they mean by best friend at work? It's when you talk to people at work about non-work related things, bringing your human to work. I can think of mine. He sits next to me. He's wonderful. He's the reason I'm engaged at work. Yeah, and we talk about our weekends. We talk about, right? yeah, and we're completely and different And you're not age. texting it. You are talking. Of course. Right. Well, he's a delight. Right. Yeah, and we have very little in common, but we were put next to each other mm -hmm. and we've struck up a friendship. So what if we're in the wrong environment though, Erica? Well, if you're in the wrong environment, what I would recommend is the 10 chapters in this book are the, in many ways, and after interviewing hundreds of millennials and Gen Z, and I have to say, when I wrote the book initially, it was from the leadership perspective. How can a leader create a human workplace? How can a manager create a human team? However, the feedback I started getting when somebody would pick it up and they'd say, oh my gosh, I am looking for a job and these are the 10 things that I want. So it's almost a way to flip it on its head and to say, I can use these 10 things to vet my next job. If I have three job offers, you know, does the company provide ongoing learning and development, which for millennials, it's one of the top three things Big people time. want, growing on the job. You know, 
diversity and inclusion. They want to work in a diverse environment. That's chapter two. I call it playing the long game. Of course. So what people can do is to say, here's a summary. I have now created a, a cheat sheet of what many people want at work. Take these, prioritize them, see which ones. I mean, you can't have everything in any <laughs> job. So pick the three, four, or five that are most important and ask those questions when you're in these interviews. Wow, Erica, great advice to end that. You know what? I think I might use this as I change, <laughs> as I change jobs. Because, you know, it's always frightening to change jobs. It, it's a, is. it really affects your life. And it really, you when you leave something that's maybe not great but is secure and try to go into something new, it's nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Work is a huge part of our lives, especially as Americans in a capitalistic society. 100%. So then on, on that last note, I would say when you're going in there, get a sense of those values and push them to make, to share examples of how they are alive at work. Awesome. Erica Kesswin, author of Bring Your Human to Work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.